Welcome Jermaine Cole, otherwise known as J. Cole. How are you? Thank you, man. I'm great. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's your second album. Second, yeah. Your first album went number one. Now your second album has also uh, yeah. gone number one. Yep. And you made it a point to drop that on the same day as <laughs> Kanye. And Billboard referred to him as your adversary. But do you really look at it that way, or is it more healthy competition? Yeah, it's definitely healthy competition. He could never be my adversary because I'm such a fan. You know what I mean? Like, I'm a, I'm a huge Kanye fan from day one. Like, you know, you have, I have day one fans of mine. I was that same kid that was from day one a Kanye fan. So, of course, it could never be adversary. I just, I'm still a competitor. So, it was just an opportunity for me to say, yo, let me see where I stand mm -hmm. against somebody that I really looked up to. You know what I mean? And, if it was Jay-Z, I would have did the same thing. You know, it was because my album was originally scheduled to come out a week after his. Well, I, it was Mine was June 25th. He tweeted June 18th right. his date. And I was like, all right, man, I'm moving my date. So if Jay-Z would have did that, I would have did the same and, thing. And you didn't get a lot of resistance from the label at first, or did yeah, you? Yeah, none. None. I got no resistance. I got respect. Like, oh, okay. Yeah, that's what you want to do? All right. <laughs> Cool. You know, we'll try to make it happen. Okay. Um, it hasn't been easy, the whole thing. I mean, you've been successful, but you're also learning a lot about public life. You made a statement about autism. Yeah. Uh, you ended up apologizing for that statement. Tell yeah. me what happened when that lyric went public, and do you think that it's something that will affect your brand going forward? Um, well, what happened was I put out the song, didn't think twice about the line, because rappers we try to be so clever with wordplay, and that's what it was, yeah. me thinking I'm being clever. And then it, it actually wasn't immediate. It was like a few weeks later after the song came out, I started seeing like activity comments from like outraged fans or just outraged people about the line, which made me think twice, like, oh man. It's like I almost realized what I said yeah. and instantly got embarrassed about it. Um, and and if you go, if you really comb through all my, I got two albums and like two classic mixtapes. If you comb through my entire discography, you're gonna find a lot more offensive yeah. things. Like that's just the nature of rap. Like somebody, it's like a lot like comedy. You know, it's like you walk that line of, of you know what I mean, of being offensive. So it won't, it was not, wasn't the first offensive thing I said, but it was the first time that I was like checked for something and really did feel bad. Like, oh my God, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And yeah. because of that, I really wanted to, to give a real apology. So what I did was I wrote a very sincere, letter i don't i think a tweet we're in a day and age where like you can tweet out oh, i apologize for this line and that's enough but i didn't think that was enough so i wrote an apology for that um which was well received i'm glad and in terms of affecting my brand i don't i don't think so i don't mm -hmm. um because i think people my brand is heartfelt people know that i mean what i say and they can tell that the apology was sincere it wasn't uh it wasn't like i got some type of endorsement and was worried about losing it or you know what i'm saying i mm -hmm. just did it I could. I actually blew it up more by by addressing, by addressing it. it and apologizing. I could have kind of kept it silent and I actually brought more attention to it. And I think that people understand that my my brand is that it's sincere, it's heartfelt. What so, did you learn from that experience uh, about just the business and being in the public eye? I learned that, man. They be careful because you're in a business in a position and and where they'll, like, you slip up, they will Mike Vick you. You know what I mean? Like, this was just a, bit, this was just a preview. Yeah. For me, it was just a preview of that. You know what I mean? So you have to be very careful with, with your movements because you're, you're a brand, and, and as fast as it comes, it can go if you make the wrong move. And I, I noticed that because media outlets that had never said anything about me, never posted any article about me, and never said a word about me, suddenly, there's a headline from there on their site that says, J. Cole apologizes over autism, uh, offensive autism. Yeah. And it's like, yo, I was never on your site before. I was not even relevant to you, but now all of a sudden, because there's controversy, I'm on your site. So it taught me, yo, you have to be very careful. A, because you don't wanna, you don't wanna offend people in that way. But B, because you slip up, you make the wrong move. You see, Mike Vick is the perfect example. You know what I mean? It's like they, you know, they got him. That's how it feels. To well, me. I mean, and you made a statement, but he fought dogs. So I right, mean, right, right. It's a total different scenario. But, but the right, effect. it's a total different. Yes, it, I I got a, just a glimpse of that because 
because of the outlets that had never said my name before. Mm, yeah. That's what taught me. It's like, yo, the negativity spirals quicker than positivity. It feels like it spreads faster. Controversy spreads faster. That's what I learned. Mm -hmm. uh, let's take it back a little because you were born in Frankfurt, but you were raised in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Yeah. Um, you were both parents in the army. Yeah, my mom was in the army before she had me. But I think when uh, by the time she had me, she was already out. So when they had my brother, um, they were both in the army, and I think she got out of the military and they had me. Um, so I was born in Germany, but I don't have any memories because yeah, we moved. Okay. We moved to Fayetteville or Fort Bragg by the time I was like, before I was even one. So your mom raised you, and yeah. you were a military kid. Kinda. I didn't grow up with my father. He was the one in the military. Okay. So my mom was already out, so it was me and her. But then um, a few years later, when I was like, you know, maybe in elementary school, her boyfriend came along, and, and that eventually became my stepfather, and he was in the Army. So I was kind of a military brat still, you know what I mean, because I, I had a stepfather who was in the <clears throat> Army. You, um, you, you're a really conscious rapper. I mean, you talk a lot about a lot of the issues that are affecting the world and the community. Your father left when you were young, and you say that 99% of your friends were raised by their mother only. Yeah. Have you refer, you, you referred to black fathers even as mystery figures in some cases. Right, absolutely. Can, can, can you establish a relationship uh, with your father? And Would that be something that you no, would be No, me and my father are, are cool. We're okay. cool. I didn't grow up with him, and we didn't have, you know, the, 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 the relationship that I would love to have, or I'm going to have with my kids, you know what I mean, when that day comes. But we, we're cool. I, I'm, my situation is nothing in comparison to kids I know. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And, and some of my friends. But yeah, it was like mystery figures growing up. It's like when I got, I didn't realize it until I got older. But looking back, it was like, yo, it's just something you never even brought up. Like nobody ever talked about their fathers. We didn't really ask questions. It was just like, it was just an understanding that, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That like your pops ain't there, my pops ain't there, his ain't, you know, it's like it was a rare thing to find one of my friends that actually had a, a father. Mm -hmm. It's a rare thing to hear about in a lot of the music today. I mean, you, uh, Tupac talked about it, Eight Ball talked about yeah. it. I mean, there were people that talked about it before, but now with auto tunes and a lot of the dance culture and everything, you don't hear the heaviness. Yeah. Is sure. that important to you to bring it the heaviness, the heaviness back? Absolutely, because that's my favorite type of music. That's my favorite type of art. Period. Things that strike emotional chords, things that are like heavy in content. Some people, it's like the type of movies, what movies do you like? Some people like comedies, romantic comedies, some people like action. The type of music that I like evokes emotion in me. And, and therefore the type of music that I make, I like to give strong emotion. So it is important to me to bring, bring out those emotions. My favorites did it, Tupac did it, Eminem did it, Nas did it. All these guys were real great storytellers that had emotion behind them and made you feel something. So I'm just trying to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. I always ask everyone, uh, how long did it take you to become an overnight success? Because success generally does not come overnight, right. although people believe it does. Right. After you did that, that verse on the Blueprint album, mm -hmm. uh, you did a lot of touring, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, take me step by step to what you did for the people who don't know the route that you took? From that point? Yeah. Well, I, I had got a deal by that point, which was a story in itself on how I got the deal. We could sit here for hours and talk about that, but I had a deal. Uh, I was on Jay-Z's album, Blueprint, which I didn't even know if that verse was gonna make it until the album came out. Like, the track list dropped, and I saw just like the rest of the world that I had made it on, onto the album. So that happened, um, and then I'm in the studio, and then he takes me on tour with him. I'm opening up. This is my first tour experience, was on tour with Jay-Z, but I'm opening up the show. And when I tell you opening up, like, literally there's 15 people in an arena, or maybe 30 people this night, or maybe on a good night there's 120 people, and I'm on stage. If the show started at 8, I was on stage at 7.50. My slot was 7.50 to 8. Like, that, that was me opening up the show. So it taught me a lot as a performer because I got to perform in front of 40 people in an arena and really do my best as if it's like 10,000 in there or whatever the case is. And the special moment each night was, the reason why I was really on that tour was because during his set, I would come out and do that verse. 
from his album. I would come out literally, I think my verse lasts 37 seconds. And I would come out there and do my 37 second verse and feel what it's like to be Jay-Z for a few minutes and, and get off the stage. So that was my first tour experience. I had performed before, that was my first tour experience. After that, calls started coming from colleges because I had this real underground buzz. So kids at college who who are the presidents of organizations, you know, they, they want to bring me to their school. Right. So that was, that was my first solo tour experience was doing just college after college after college. Before you know it, by that next year, I'm on my own tour doing clubs, 400, 500 people venues. It's just, it's just a slow growth. And before you knew it, I had been out on the road three straight years. Like I never, I never actually got off the road, it felt like. So yeah. that, was, that was my experience. And the, the, the singles, Who That and Workout, didn't do spectacular. But Who That didn't. Okay. Oh, well, Workout didn't at first either, if that's what you mean. Yeah, like in the beginning. Right, right, but right. But then you ended up selling yeah, like yeah. over 200,000 copies in right. your first week with your debut album. Absolutely. Was that a testament to the fact that you did so much work on the road, on the business side, yeah. and that you built fan by fan? Right, absolutely. So, yeah, Who That was my first single I had ever put out. It, it didn't connect the radio because it was aggressive. It was just a real rap song with me rapping on it. Um, and just like you said, by the time I released an album, finally got a release date from the label. By the time I had released that album, uh, released the album, I didn't have a, a, a song that was connecting that radio. Workout was out, and it, it eventually was two times platinum. It was out, but it, it was nowhere on the charts. It wasn't connecting yet. So when I did those numbers, 220 some thousand or 217,000, nobody expected that. Nobody in the industry expected it. I didn't even know I was gonna do those numbers. Um, and what that was, was just a result of consecutive nonstop touring and also a combination of releasing free projects, which was really albums. So you, you take these mixtapes, these classic mixtapes mixed with my touring, you develop a real fan base. The music business didn't know that. The industry didn't know that. The record label didn't know. Even though they'd seen 50 and other people do it on some level before, yes. they still didn't yeah. get how to do it. Yeah, right? they didn't understand it because 50, he had in the club, which was a huge hit. I didn't have a hit. The industry mind state at this time, up until I dropped my album, <laughs> was the industry mind state was we sign an artist, we put the artist in the studio. When we feel he has a song that's ready, or he convinces us that th this song is the one, we put this song out. If it connects, we give him a release date, we put him out, we see what happens. That If, they, if you didn't have a song that connected at radio, in, in the music, uh, to the record label, how, why would you put out an album? Mm -hmm. They didn't see that when I go do these shows and it's a thousand kids outside, or I'm, doing, I'm going to Toronto and I'm selling it and it's 4,000 kids in Toronto, or I go to LA and it's 3,000, they don't see that. You know, they, they couldn't, con they, they didn't know if that translated to sales. So what we learned is a real solid fan base is way more important than a, a record at radio in the clubs because you have rappers right now who would love to switch positions with me, but they're way hotter than me. They got way more songs than me on the radio. They got way more songs than me in the club. I go in the club, I go out a lot. When I go out in the club, I might hear my, they probably only playing my song because I'm in the club that night. I don't have a lot of mm. club records that move the club, but I go in the club and I hear a million songs from this rapper, a million songs from that rapper, but that rapper can't sell the records I sell because he's not connecting to the people the way that I am. He is on the radio and he is when they want to party, but in terms of touring, in terms of saying the things that's going to affect their lives, in terms of an emotional connection, feeling they don't have that. So that's, you know, that's what led to those, those first week sales on the first album, which changed, then changed the game. And to hear you talk, you can hear the analysis, the methodology, the process. Right. Uh, you went to college. Yes, sir. You graduated magna cum laude, I hope I'm saying that right, from yeah. St. John's yep. University. And uh, that's something that's very rare that you don't hear a lot from with a lot of rappers. You don't talk about it a lot. I do, whenever they ask me about it, absolutely, okay. absolutely. But did that help you? Did education help you become a rapper and be successful in the rap game? I think so. I think. Um I'm a communications major, and and I took I took a PR class, which 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 
I have a, a publicist team, but they're not the ones that wrote the letter or even told me that before I even, before I was on it before my, then this is with the, with the autism apology. I was right. on it before my PR team even called me because I recognized that, hey, this is, this is something that I need to address right now. It's almost like I'm Pepsi and I realized that, yo, one of my employees made a mistake and I need to apologize for this. That was wrong. Right. And I don't want to send out the wrong message as a company that I don't care about that. So the school side of me, the side that went to school, understands that it's important to address that and address it sincerely. Like I knew how to address it because of that part of my education. So that right there is an example of how it helped mm -hmm. me. And, and you know, I don't think another rapper might be equipped with that. But in general, it just gave me another life experience, four years of a life experience that other rappers don't have. And it's so it gives my perspective is unique and it's because how because it because college forces you to show that you can start and finish something and to set goals that's true and to too meet deadlines that's true too that's a great point but really more so just because I'm I left my city I left town I went to another place that I didn't know anybody I met kids from all over and developed relationships and I learned so much more and I grew and there's more experiences over here that are unique to me and a bunch of kids out there that are in school or went to school that the average rap story that we know about came from the hood, had to sell drugs, you know, which is, I respect those stories because these are my friends too, these are, the, these are their stories, but yeah. I'm bringing something else and it's not likely, but you know, it's do just my story. You, do you think it, from a marketing standpoint, do you think it would have been easier if you had sold drugs in the streets For of New sure. York and that was part of your narrative? Yeah. Is that sure. more respected than graduating For sure. magna cum laude? For sure. For sure. And, and not to my fans and not to like the new generation of like young kids, you know what I mean? But there's an appeal. Like Scarface is, is a lot of kids' favorite movie for a reason. There's an appeal about that edginess of like, yo, I was in the streets and I sold drugs. There's an appeal about that. So when you have that story and it's real and authentic and you can mix that with a real skillful way to tell it, of course, it would have been way easier for me to have my rapping ability and my production ability and to have a story like that. Has it, has it, has it hurt you even before when you were in high school when you were saying, hey, I'm going to college, I'm working hard. Uh, you know, Harvard University did a study called Acting White that shows that black and Hispanic kids in high school uh, actually inflict a social penalty on kids that excel. The Definitely. higher your grade point average, the, the less popular you are. Mm. Now, they didn't control for athletics because you were an athlete, so right, maybe right. that helped. But did you run into that? Were you, were you not black enough? No, okay. no. I, uh, I never ran into that, but what they're saying is absolutely true. I saw that. I was actually maybe a part of that, and it didn't have to do with GPA, but it did have to do with a certain way you speak in a certain way. Like that, it's a high school mentality, you know what I mean? Especially with, and it's only with blacks. It's a very high school mentality that only carries over sometimes. But no, I didn't have to deal with that for some reason. Like I'm, the, I'm the kid that was, maybe it was because of sports. I don't know, but I didn't have to deal with that. Like being smart, I had friends that looked up to that. Like, like what was you? Let me see your report card. Oh, you like it was like, oh, you smart. <laughs> like, oh, you smart. Like that's what they would say. Like really, I, I thought I, you I, were messing around right. in school, like, like me. Nigga, you smart, exactly. <laughs> right. It was almost like, yo, you didn't tell me you were smart. That's what they Kept would say. That secret, right. exactly. It was like, nah, I just didn't, you know. And then I go to the AP classes or the honors classes. It was, it's funny. It was a funny memory, matter of fact. It was always a surprise to them. But North Carolina is not a place known for producing a lot of rappers. Right. So did you make the, the judgment that, you know what, if I go to school in New York, yeah. that could also help my rap career? For sure. Like it might be easier to make it from there. For sure, absolutely, because this is before this day and age. In this day and age, you can make it from wherever. Right? As long as you have a computer and some great music, like, you can find people. Back then, the internet age, what well, this was 03 when I decided to go to school. So the internet, you weren't, people weren't blowing up on the internet. So I was like, yo, I, I'm not gonna do it from here. From Fayetteville, North Carolina, like it's, it can't happen. Nobody's looking here. Nobody's coming here. And even if I go to Chapel Hill, which I almost went to UNC Chapel Hill, nobody's coming there either. Let me go 
to where it's at. You were you doing I mean? a lot of rap in college? Were you known? Because I know you were on the Pan African. Yeah, Haraya. You were the president. Shout of the, out to Haraya. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, of, yeah. of the Pan African Council. Yeah, absolutely. But were you really recording and putting out mixtapes and everything no, in college? Not mixtapes, but I was recording. So I'll tell you how it went. I got to school. I might have made seven beats my freshman year, which is nothing. Like, that's terrible. But why? Because I was caught up in being in New York City in a dorm room, in a building, and my dorm room had girls on the floor right under me. I could literally walk out my room, walk down the stairs, and there's girls all on this floor. Every door I knock on is girls. Like, I don't live with my mom no more. You know what I mean? <laughs> I have a freedom that I never had. I'm in New York City, so I was, I'm in school. So it was just my whole freshman year, it was just like an adjustment. I almost forgot that I even did music. Thankfully, I brought my beat machine, so it would, it would remind me, but I still made seven beats that year, maybe. You know, maybe 10, I don't know. My sophomore year is when I kind of started to remember, like, okay, don't forget why you came up here. You know what I mean? And, and, and get back to it. By my junior year, I was all the way back in, uh, writing songs all the time. I would walk to school or walk to class, have rhymes in my head, writing, writing raps in class, making beats at home. Like, I got back into it. And, and really got focused so that by the time I graduated, I already had the momentum that I needed to carry me through the next two years of being broke and, and, and really. But a lot of people did not know that you were doing, that you were a rapper. Right, yeah, because I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't broadcast it. I, there's two different, not even two different types. The normal type of rapper, and some of these guys are my friends, and some of these guys have made it, like, uh, like even Kendrick, I've talked to Kendrick. Kendrick, Kendrick Lamar. Lamar. Everybody knew him around Compton as like the young little rapper. You know what I mean? Yeah. We've had this conversation. And I know guys like that. They're not as talented as Kendrick, but like when you walk around, they call you by your rap name. Like I know guys like that. They've been rapping since they was 12. Everywhere they go, they're in their rap persona. Whatever their rap persona is, they're <laughs> in it. I'm telling right. you. So when, you know, I got friends like this. Everywhere they go, 16 years old. Now they're 16 and people still calling them by their rap name. Now they're 21, people still calling them by rap. Me? Nah, I knew my, ability, my talent and my ability, but I enjoyed my regular life. I like hanging out with my friends as me, as Jermaine. I enjoyed that life. So with mine, it was like an alter ego. All the mm -hmm. way through high school, it was like I had my regular life, but then I would, have, I would go at night to the studio with my mentors, and I would be a whole nother person. Like, they would call me by my rap name. Then I'd be in the city with my friends, riding around the city and we'd be at the gas station and somebody would come up to me and I'm with my regular friends and somebody would come up to me at this time it was therapist be like yo therapist what's up yo I was loving that joint you did that I heard on the CD and I'd be like oh what's up man how you doing that, that like, must be how it is like for Mr. Carter when he's hanging with Warren Buffett yeah <laughs> a word it's a whole nother world a whole nother world so like so yeah I didn't broadcast it you know even throughout college people didn't weren't really aware unless you saw me at an open mic or something People who start from New York have an advantage. I mean, if you are, if you are born in New York, For if sure. you're born, if you're from the Bronx, if you're from Queens, you can say I'm from Queens, yeah. and all over the United States, you yeah. have credibility. <laughs> yeah. It's different than for Baby, right? Yeah, it's them absolutely. and Wayne. I, it, that, is that part of the reason why rappers from other parts of the nation kind of have a chip on their shoulder about New York? Uh, yes. That's absolutely it. New York is, they almost spoiled. You know what I mean? I got a line on my first album that says, uh, came to take advantage of that, y'all took all that stuff y'all took for granted. I'm talking to, hmm. to the dudes in New York who don't even know. I used to get in arguments at the barbershop all the time in New York. And I'm this country kid from Carolina and I like Lil Wayne and I'm in the TI and I'm trying to put them on the UGK and I'm trying to show it. And at this, right. this time they're killing the South. Like, Every barbershop in New York is hating on the South because they're running the game. Right. And I'm the only one in there trying to argue against them. And you got, little, you got dudes in there that want to be rappers and they hating harder. And I'm thinking in my mind like, well, you don't even know. You're in the land of opportunity. This is, I came up here for this opportunity and you just sit around and let all this opportunity pass by you. And you from here. You and it could mean? be that you could have went the South route. You could have been. Yeah, I could have went to Atlanta. Your at that style time. is not necessarily like that. Though, right, right, right. right. No, no, you are not. more kind more, of fit yeah, into I got the a, New York Exactly. Thing. I got a more East Coast influence style. All my favorite rappers was was East Coast based rappers. Like they had a style, even Pac, rep, 
west side very hard, but he had an east coast flow. Um, the fact that you, we talked about being uh, president of the Pan-African Coalition. Uh, your mother is white, mm -hmm. but you kind of think of yourself as black. I read a, a quote where you said, I identify more with what I look like yeah. because that's how I got treated. Not necessarily in a negative way, but when you get pulled over by the police, you can't pull out your half white car. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> that's the and, truth. And, and it really resonated because it, it depends on the scenario sometimes. If you're president of the United States, that's when race gets delineated right. and people start, well, it's mom's way. Right, right, right. Um, right. That's, that's absolutely true. But uh, in the state that you're from, North Carolina, there are about 230,000 black males in, enrolled in high school in 2009. Only 58% of them graduated from high school compared to 71% of white males. Do you think that you are uniquely positioned to speak to these kids, so many of them that want to be rappers, and that's part of the reason they haven't got their stuff together in school, because they're focused disproportionately on that dream? Yeah. And not enough on school. So do I think that I'm one of the, I'm a part of the reason? No, that you're someone that can help Absolutely. show people Absolutely. That's that what, you can do yeah. both. It's not an either or yes. thing or a zero yes. sum game. Absolutely, that's what I want to do, and I don't want them to do both. I want I want people to follow their dreams. Yes. So I never want to be the person to tell somebody to not do something. But I'm not interested in telling young black kids how to be rappers. I'm not interested in that. But one of my goals is showing them. Every time I speak to them, every, I have a foundation back home, Dreamville Foundation. Every time I speak to these kids, I want to show them that there's a, the only reason they want to be rappers is because that's all they know. That's all they see is J. Cole, Jay-Z, Drake. All they see is that. Or they either want to be rappers or basketball players because that's, that's the only real role models we have when we watch television. I want to try to find a way to show them that, no, we, you could be a journalist. You ever thought about writing the stories that that you, or you could be, you could be an author, or you ever thought about taking pictures? Like they never, some of these kids have never been exposed to a real camera, or real what photography really is. So how, of course they only want to be rappers and basketball players. That's all they really get exposed to in these situations. I want to show them like, no, there's a ton of other things you can be just as, you can be the biggest painter of all time. You can be Basquiat or whoever, you know what I mean? I just want to show them that yeah. there's, a, there's so many other paths you can be besides a rapper or besides a basketball player. So I'm not interested in them doing both. I'm interested in them doing one, going to school first and foremost and picking something that they're passionate about other than rapping. I'm not, I'm not into that. How did you, how were you affected by the Trayvon Martin thing? Uh, I just say, I'm literally coming from watching Food Vale Station right now, which is, if anybody doesn't know, Oscar Grant's story. And Trayvon Martin is on par with that. I was like, mm -hmm. I felt like I really wanted to see some, like action. I really wanted to see movement. And I really thought, and I still think that that is an opportunity for black people in America to rally behind this young man's murder and, and change the way we think about each other. You know what I mean? And the way that we, I don't know, I feel like Twitter, as is, is crazy it is for me to say this, Twitter is the first black community we've had in a long time. Hmm. You know what I mean? It's like the first time blacks have actually, and, and I don't think we recognize it right now because everybody's just into Twitter and like making jokes and, and when there's a cause, we all get mad. But Twitter is a, is a real, the Trayvon Martin situation showed me this. Twitter is a real opportunity for black people to, to have a sense of community again and like really have leaders and really have you know, movement. I can say right now, yo, let's have a rally tomorrow. I'm throwing a free show in New York City. Meet me in the park. There's going to be 5,000 kids there. You know what I mean? All off of Twitter. Oh, and not all black either, right? Not all black have, at all. Exactly. You're reaching out to everybody. Right. And they're embracing. Yes. This generation is embracing you more yeah. than the previous exactly. generation. Exactly. That, that's what I got from Trayvon Martin. It's terrible. I, I'm mad. You know, I get angry. But I also look at it as an opportunity to, to flip the anger for all, all black people in America to kind of flip the anger and, and, and really realize who we are and, and how we're viewed in this society, you know what I mean? And, and work hard to change that because it, it's gotta be us. There's gonna be no handouts. It has, to, it has to start with us. jay Z's had a lot of great things to say about it too, uh, really profound things. He, it was funny because you initially went to him with a beat 
with CD, right? And you got shot down. Yep. You wouldn't even take it. Yeah. And then eventually he heard you when you went through your management company. Yeah. And you got signed, and he came yeah. around. What is your relationship uh, with him like? Are you just signed to his label, the first guy signed to Rock Nation, or do you get a lot of access and mentorship from Jay Z? I do. I do. I get as much as I as I need. You know what I mean? Like. And I do need it. Uh, usually in album time, I like to like really get his perspective. You know what I mean? But I, yeah. I get I get his advice. He's seen the game, top to bottom. I look. I tell you like this. He's seen. That would almost, be about ten thousand dollars an hour, by the way, if you were paying him as a consultant. Exactly. But I, he's seen so many people come and go. Like dudes that I used to look up to and like was playing their songs. He's seen them come, get hot be on top of the world, and the next thing you know, they're absent. And then the next guy comes and takes their place. And then they get hot, and then they start to fall off, and then somebody comes and takes their place. He's seen them all, and he's still here and still on top. So the amount of it, of wisdom and knowledge that he has, because of things, it's almost like he's seen this movie eight times, and he can always tell me, like, yo, if you do this, it just reminds me of when such and such did this. And I, so I'm a real strategic, overanalyzing at times, but I'm, I'm, I'm really plot things, and he's the same way. And so I, I like to get advice from him. But, you know, one thing that stands out is that you are in the clubs. You're yeah. 28, right? Yeah, 28. 28 yeah. Jay-Z, for all that he's accomplished, he's, he's got a wife and kid at home. Absolutely. Uh, 44 years old in December. Wow, 44. Um, so what happens if you disagree with him on something and say, wait, man, just a minute. Or is he that relevant that he knows what a 16-year-old oh, kid no, is going to no, like? No, 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 no. I mean, are, have, are there disagreements? Yeah, of course. Okay. There's really nothing to disagree about. It's his opinion, and I take his opinion and process it. I, I get a bunch of opinions along the way. His is one of them, a little more weighted. Is he open to suggestions? <laughs> Absolutely. It is, okay. well, well, I'm really just getting his suggestions. Like, you know, if, if I'm working on an album, yo, what do you think I should do with this single? If I don't agree with it, that's fine. But he's, giving, he's just doing what he can to give me what he knows and offer me his advice. So he's not mad if I don't take his advice. It's cool. Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, what about, uh, does he give you access to his circle? I mean, when you think about your opportunity mm -hmm. and who, the things that you could do, right. your, your potential is so enormous. Thank you. With your background and the, everything that you've accomplished so far. So if he gave you access to people like William Wesley, Uncle West, as mm -hmm. people know, or LeBron James or Warren Buffett. Uh, when you meet those people, you also get, you could get advice from them. Yeah, do you absolutely. do you get to see them? Do you meet them and for talk sure, to them? For sure, absolutely. Uncle West, yep. LeBron, yep. You what know. have you learned from, I mean, what is it like to learn from them? What have you learned um, just from observing them? Man, it's a marathon. You know what I mean? This thing is a long distance race. This business is a long distance thing. You want to be relevant, you want to be around, you want to be providing for your family 10, 15, 20 years from now. You just said jay Z's about to be 44. He put out his first album when he was 25. That's 20 years of relevancy, you know? And like, I was just, so that's what it teaches me, being around all of these guys. Even Uncle West, like, been in this for a, a while. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's been around the game of basketball for a long time. It's, it's, it's longevity. It's not, so when I make decisions, whether which single, uh, this show or that show or this tour, should I get on this feature? Should I take this money to do this song? Or should I make my decisions more calculated about, is this something that's going to be, like, does this further my career? Or does this, you know, I, I think about things in that, in that manner. What does this do for me in the long run? In, in rock music, you have a lot of people that become stars and they say, I'm not in it for the money. Right. I disdain money. Right, right, but right. in rap, it's different mm -hmm. because it's aspirational. Right. So a lot of people will just say, I'm trying to take over. That's true. Do you want to make a lot of money? I do want to make a lot of money, but, but that's only for safety purposes. Like, I don't have a lust of money and I don't have a, I actually don't even have a love of money. Like you got people, I know these people, 
You know, they're my friends, and, and they're also rappers that I know. They love money. They're addicted to getting money. And that's cool, too, because that's what makes some of the most successful businessmen. I don't love money like that. I love the comfort and the safety and the ability to retire my mom or, like, if there's a problem with my brother or if my father has a problem. I like that feeling of being able to provide. So that's the thing I, I, I do love about money. But to tell you the truth, what makes me the happiest is the music, working on the music. I'm in the studio right now with Elvana. We, I'm producing for another person. That makes me happy. That makes me way more happy than getting a check. My album comes out. The response is amazing. That makes me way more happy. If I write a song, I made Let Nas Down uh, a song off my album. When I made that song, the feeling that I made, that I had after I made that song is way more important to me than, than making money. You know, but yeah, of course I want to make a lot of money so I can be safe just in case something pops How did off it in America and you? I need it. How, How did, did it, it change you or the people around you when you really blew up? When you started to say, wow, you know, I have a number one record out there. How did it affect, how did your life change? Uh, just, just, it wasn't as hard. Money, it wasn't as hard in terms of doing things. There was a time when just, just to pay rent or something, my mom had to hustle. Like not literally sell drugs, but like make something happen. Borrow it from this friend or like pawn this. There was a lot of maneuvering just to do like everyday things, you know what I mean? There's people that had it way worse than us. I can't imagine what somebody's doing off of 15,000 a year with a kid, you know what I mean? It makes it, it makes those things easier. It allows you to live your life without worry about the, the small things, you know what I mean? But in terms of my personality, I don't know what it did to that. I'm not sure. I, I'm not aware of that. I would like to think that because I have the same friends around me, that I'm as close to who I was as as possible. Did it change any people around you? No. No, because my, my circle is tight, and these are people that have been with me for years. I cannot, there's not a name that comes to my mind that, that at least in my close-knit circle, that, it, that this money or this situation changed. There's some people that were outside of my circle to begin with, that of course, there was a situation or there was some drama, but nobody who I love, did it change. Mm -hmm. When you came, we're almost done. So when no, you it's came, fine. as long into, as you want to do this, by the way, I'm loving this conversation. When you came into the business, a lot of people uh, talk about how hard it is to make it in the business, and you have to know someone. You have to be a member of the Illuminati. You have to be <laughs> this underworld. What do you think of all that? Um, which part? Well, it's hard to make it, or the Illuminati? Yeah, part? when people say that that exists and. I mean, you're in the world, so now you see. Right. And, and obviously... Ah, so I can't, I can't... Because they made a headline the last time I tried to say this, out of what I said. But I, now that I'm over here and people say that, of course, it's easy for me to write it off be like, yo, y'all are so dumb. I could say that. I could say, like, oh, y'all are so stupid. But I can't be so quick to say that because I do remember a time when I was nowhere close to being in this business, if a rumor came out, and, and there was a video online about, here's proof that such and such is in the Illuminati. I was already a conspiracy theorist in my heart. So I was in a position where like, I would be one of the gullible people to like, believe that. So when I remember that, I'm just like, oh man, these people just don't know no better. Was that part of, was part of the reason because you were trying to make it and you weren't sure? about the industry and how mm. to get in or no, I think why I was, were you a conspiracy I think, theorist? I think I was in a, a, at a point in my life where I was, um, at that particular time, I was at a point in my life where I was just really seeing the world for what it was and it really was disgusted at why, why did the world work like this? Why, why are these people living like this but these people are living like this and who's controlling that? It, it, has, it felt like somebody has to have their, their, somebody has to be pulling the strings somewhere, which I do feel like that in a sense, but I was new to that world, so I was more right. gullible but to, to, those, to those types of stories. When you got into the rap business and you started to see, because we talked about black people right. uh, in, in business in general, you started to see ownership mm -hmm. and how ownership works and, and, and how far we have to go. Because Jay-Z, he's made a lot of money, mm -hmm. but then when you see Warren Buffett exactly. and, and just the comparison, right. and Oprah Winfrey compared to Bill Gates. Right. Was it more obvious to you when you became a star? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. When you got closer and you got into the world absolutely. and you started to and see And those weren't, those weren't, by the way, those weren't beliefs that I carried with me. It was just like, hmm, maybe, like, I wonder, I don't want to, I don't want anybody to think that I ever believed those things, but I was susceptible, more likely to believe them at that point than I was. But when I got into the business and I became closer to, to these people in this situation, you realize, like, oh, man, what are you talking about? Like, these are right. regular people, you know what I mean? These are... These are people, this man is from Marcy Projects, Jay-Z. He's from the project. You think they're going like to they let him into the Illuminati? He's <laughs> okay. from the project. And he doesn't have enough money compared to these guys. Jay-Z is our top. We look at Jay-Z, everybody in the black community looks at Jay-Z like, oh, man, everybody want to be Jay-Z. But when you really know people's money level, you know that he wants to be up there. Like, when it comes to being businessmen, he wants to be Warren Buffett. Or Bill Gates, like that's a that's another level of money. That does we, it shock you that w to think the idea that some doors are closed to Jay Z still? Absolutely. But, or do you believe? Are they? I mean, is the world his no, oyster? No, no, okay. no. The doors are closed. He's breaking them down. That's why I'm loving the fact that he's still active. He's breaking doors down every year, every album. But yeah, there's still doors. They don't want to see him. They don't want him. Jay. Nope. The man that has. 20 billion does not want to see Jay-Z have the same amount of money as him. No way. You know what I mean? And, and even if it's not that direct, the system is not set up for Jay-Z to make it up there. So he's breaking down doors. As he's, even if they're not conscious doors, they're like systemic doors. You know what I mean? That have been placed there. They're subconscious doors that are still there for, for somebody like Jay-Z. What doors do you want to break down? Because you have music, but you're, you're this guy that has a lot of talent. You've excelled in a lot of different areas. Uh, so as you move forward, where do you see yourself being besides rap? Besides rap? Music is my passion, man. Um, production. Besides the actual art of rapping, I wanna, uh, there's a lot I want to accomplish on the production end and the production side. I would love to try my hand at acting. My mother's an actress. She tells me all the time that she thinks it's in me. She's been telling me that for years. Boy, you're an actor, I'm telling you. She always <laughs> tells me, you know, so I, I would love to try my hand at that and see have, if I'm any good. Do you good. use your access? I mean, you probably could call Will Smith and get some advice. Yeah, that's very, I could. Do I, you do that I stuff? have the connection at least to, to do that. I don't, I guess because I'm not passionate about it yet. It's just a thought. Um, but hopefully when I, when I become passionate or when I take it serious, I, I would use that card. You just gave me the card to use. You gave me the idea for it. So, but yeah, I, I do have access. I'm not actually good at uh, being resourceful. I'm getting better. That's another thing to be a great businessman. I think you have to be incredibly resourceful. I'm new to business, period. I never was good with money. So having money is new to me and therefore using my resources. Being a, a great businessman is, is new to Do me. Do you tap into the advisors of people like Jay-Z that can help you deal with Absolutely. wealth? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I'm starting that. I'm starting. I'm, you're talking to a man that's very early on. Are you spending a lot of money? Um, on ex on expenses. Are you, are you going into a club with no, no, eighty thousand no, 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 dollars no, no, in a no, no, garbage no. bag like no, no. some people we know? No, I've seen that. I've <laughs> seen that live in person. I can't do that. I don't have. I'm too afraid of losing, of of going back over there to ever blow money without thinking about it. There's a song on my album called Chaining Day, and and this is the type of artist I am. And this album is is like this to a T. Most rappers are gonna say. Paid a hundred thousand dollars for the chain, and they're just gonna show you their chain. That's what they song. I paid a hundred thousand dollars for the chain. I paid a hundred thousand dollars for the chain. I paid a hundred thousand dollars for the chain, and that's their whole song. And they, the whole song is gonna tell you how they spent a hundred thousand dollars for the chain. My song is gonna tell you like my thought process before I paid all of this money for some jewelry, which was it, it really it was like this. Like oh my god, like yo, yes, do I want it? Yes. How much? People pay that? <laughs> and then my internal conversation was like, yo, you know better. Like, you definitely know you know better than to spend this type of money. But do you want it? Is it worth it? What's the investment? Well, when I'm on stage, it's going to look really good. So you can say it's for your career. Uh, man, it does look nice. How much? And it's a more internal conversation. Man, you know what you can do with all that money? You know whose lives you could change with that type of money? You're going to spend that on a chain? So that other song was, I spent $100,000 on a chain. I spent a hundred. And then in my song, you get all of these internal thoughts that led me to finally be like, all right, 
here you go. And I wrote the check, or at least I gave him my card. You know what I mean? But I, I gave you my thought process first before I just spent $100,000 on a chain. <laughs> J. Cole value added. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. Okay, finally, we just have a couple Facebook people that have questions. Cool. Nina Caravan wants to know, if you weren't rapping, what would you be doing as a career? Um, I get that question a lot, and I, I probably answer it differently all the time. I don't really know the answer to that. Uh, because I can't picture myself being as passionate about music as I am with, with, or as I am with music with anything else. But I would like to think now that I'm older, I would be doing something, I don't know, uh, more useful. And I, I have a voice and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I can speak to these kids and I can make a difference and I can touch people's lives. So I'm not trying to belittle what I do, but I, I, I'm now at an age where I appreciate intelligence. I appreciate knowledge. I, I wish I would have paid more attention in college. Everybody's like, oh, you went to college, you graduated magna cum laude, which I did, and I was, I was good at school, but I don't think I retained a lot of the information. I took three philosophy classes, and I couldn't tell you about none of these guys' uh, philosophies. You know what I mean? I, I took theologies, and, and now I'm in an age where I, I want to know about those things, and I went through those classes for nothing. So I don't know what I'll be doing, but I hope I'll be doing something a little more useful uh, or, or using my intelligence a little more and learning more you know what I mean I know you don't hear rappers say that but that's how I feel okay Brian Bronx DJ wants to know with all the ups and downs you've encountered over the years when you were an upcoming artist what's the one factor that kept you going just belief belief that's the only thing that, that, that can keep you going is belief that that you know that deal is a week away that deal is right around the corner. It's a month away. I got one. I used to tell people all the time. My mom, when I graduated college, she was like, "Okay, sweetie, what are you gonna do? You graduated school with?" I'm like, "Mom, I'm about to get a record deal." Did no. she believe that? I, no, no way she <laughs> no, believed that. Would. I think at that point she was like, "All right, come on, it's time to like, it's time to." She believed in me, but I think the her concern over her son's future was kind of like, "Well, you sure you don't? You should probably just go to law school now." In her mind, she wants her son to be safe and to pick a great field. She thinks I, I should have been a lawyer, but in my mind, it's like, no, nah, ma, you don't know. I'm about to get a, I'm about to get a record deal in a month. Like I already got some things lining up. It took two years later, I finally got a record deal. But in my mind, it was always the belief of it was right around the corner. You almost got have to lie to yourself, you know. But the talent has to be there too. You can't lie to yourself, and then the talent and the hard work have to be there as well. You can't lie to yourself and be like, man, I'm about to make the league, and you're not even on the basketball team. Right, as we discussed. A exactly. lot of kids have that dream, but right. they're not on the team. Finally, right. uh, from Darren Sands, he says, I wanted to ask him about his voice changing. He has a grovelly, husker, huskier tone to his voice now. Three to four years ago, <laughs> his tone was more buoyant. But my guess is that a lot of recording and a lot of shows changed that. What are his thoughts on that, and does he think it's made him sound better. First um, of all, do you think your voice has changed? Uh, I think just age. I think just, you know, just, I don't think your voice ever stops changing really. Maybe when you hit a certain age, but I mean, I think I was young. Four years ago, I was 24, I was, you know? Yeah. I was younger. Um, I think that's all it is, is just age. Do I think it's made me, made me sound better? Yeah, I like my voice now. I like, you know, I still liked it back then, but if you listen to my stuff when I was 15, brother, <laughs> terrible. Well. <laughs> squeaky, 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 squeaky. So but, yeah. uh, finally, uh, what was your first advance, by the way? I'm not even gonna put it out there. I'm still way too close to my first advance to like, it was very low. But I don't know what artists get these days. I think it's higher, uh, slightly higher than what a new artist gets, but I, I still feel like it was low. Like, but when you got your first big check, right. whenever that was or whatever that it was. It was only like four years ago, so it was like kind of close to When you got your first big check, do you remember that day? Absolutely. Yeah. Picked it up from the lawyer's office. You want me to tell you about the day? Yeah, just. Picked it up from the lawyer's office. I don't even think I had, I didn't even have an account anywhere. I picked it up from the lawyer's office. You didn't have a bank account? No, I, I, man, I didn't even have a cell phone. I was still borrowing somebody's cell phone. I was using a borrowed cell phone. Some, one of my homeboys let me just hold his phone for a while. I never gave it back. 
I just used to get his text messages. People used to text him <laughs> thinking it was him. It was just me being nosy. So I, I didn't even have a cell phone. Took the check from the lawyer's office to just like Citibank or who at whatever bank it was in Manhattan. And was just like, yeah, can I open an account? And set the check on the table. And they look at the check like, you think we're just supposed to believe that some young black kid brings in a, you know, some X, X thousand dollar check? You know, and I was like, I, I was new to this. So I had to really go through a whole process, start a bank account. They grilled me, asked me some questions about like, what's going on? I had to explain to them like, yeah, I just got a record deal. I need to open up a bank account. And there you have it, I just deposited it. All right, man, well, you can buy your boy a cell phone <laughs> company now. Word. Not to come, maybe boost. <laughs> that prepaid action, that's pretty doing pretty well right now, actually. Word. The market AT&T is yeah. actually going prepaid. Ah, I did hear about that. I just met some reps from AT&T. They told me that. I think, by the way, I think that's the best. We don't need to discuss it, but I think that's the best plan. Like uh, Flex, I think T-Mobile had a Flex plan. Held me down. Like in those years when my credit wasn't, wasn't good enough and I couldn't get a cell phone. But, but, but you really could be a corporate spokesman. Do you see yourself getting endorsements and getting into the endorsement game? Absolutely, if, if it makes sense and it's right. You don't have any now yet? Um, small things, one-offs. We do one-offs with companies, uh, you know, but, but no major long-term endorsement deal right now, no. Okay, well, you're, you're on the right team with Jay-Z. Yeah, absolutely. To help you do that. Absolutely. Congratulations, Thank Jermaine. You, Appreciate you, brother. Appreciate you, Keep man. Keep up the good work. Thank you. And with J. Cole, I'm Lee Hawkins. We'll see you next time.